Firstly, no. By death to homosexuals, I am not proclaiming that they need to be put to death, but that homosexuals are responsible for killing more homosexuals than non-homosexuals are responsible for killing homosexuals. And that's in various ways, and unfortunately it's a very destructive lifestyle at various levels, as we'll see at the rest of the video. Now, if you call yourself a Christian, and you cannot deal with homosexuals in a graceful and loving manner, or l deal with anyone in a graceful and loving manner, then please, the best thing that you could possibly do is... Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Now, I'm going to read a statement by longtime homosexual activist, the actor Harvey Firestein. And he wrote uh, the following op-ed for the New York Times in July 31st, 03, and it's titled The Culture of Dece Disease. So, we produced advertisement, created enlightenment programs, spent endless hours making certain that AIDS or being HIV positive was nothing to be ashamed of. We did a great job, maybe too great a job. After all, the efforts extended to convince the world that AIDS is not a gay disease, we now have a generation embracing AIDS as its gay birthright. Many of our young men see infection as a rite of passage, an inevitable coming of age. I hear them seeking the disease as entry into the cool, queer inner circle that being negative denies them. Unlike the photos and the ads we see, most of my friends who are on drug cocktails, drug cocktails to treat, treat HIV, he means, are not having the time of their lives. They spent mornings in the bathroom throwing up or suffering from diarrhea. They spent afternoons at doctor's appointments, clinics, and pharmacies. And they spent endless evenings planning their estates and trying to make ends meet because they're not well enough to support themselves and their new drug habit. And those, of us, and those are just the friends for whom the drug works. For many women, the cocktails are nothing but a drain on finances, internal organs, and stamina. We have done a terrific job removing the stigma of having AIDS. But in doing so, we fail to eliminate the disease HIV is, and pay close attention to what he states here, is an almost completely avoidable infection. You need to be compliant in some very specific behaviors to be at risk. In fact, if every person now infected vowed that the disease end, we could wipe out the ballooning number of new infections. Instead, we've sold our next generation into drug slavery and their destiny to medical researchers because we'd rather treat each other as sexual objects than as family. Stop minimizing the infection with cute little names like the gift or the bug. So from here, we'll be viewing a video that covers various aspects of the destructive nature of the homosexual lifestyle from a out of love for the gay community who is being pushed because of political agendas into doing self-destructive behaviors. So the secular case is going to ask these questions. Um, what impact does homosexual behavior have on individuals in general, the ones who engage in the behavior and the ones that they directly impact and what impact does it have on society as a whole? So those are two different questions that I think are valid for a secular case regarding. Secular doesn't mean anti-biblical. It just means in addition to, other than. So we want to determine, should we encourage this behavior or not? I mean, the current issue is not uh, just live and let live. That's been going on for a long time. This is about approving. I mean, society as, a, as courts and laws and this sort of thing, and even just public opinion, we could do one of four things. We can prohibit behavior like murder, you're not allowed to do that. That's prohibited. 
We can discourage behavior like smoking. There's extra taxes on it and things like this, and it's discouraged, and you can't do it in certain places at certain times. Um, we, uh, we could protect behavior. We not only allow it, but we actually protect it, like speech, free speech. Speech is a protected thing we have. And we could even reward behavior like marriage or military service. Certain behaviors we actually reward as society. So we're kind of saying, where is homosexual behavior on this scale? Should it be prohibited, discouraged, protected, rewarded, or just, you know, laissez-faire, just kind of allowed? At the very least, what I'm about to share with you says this. It should not be rewarded. It certainly shouldn't be rewarded and encouraged to, to increase. In short, homosexual behavior is bad for individuals and society because, well, for one, it's related to various physical afflictions, which you're not going to get argument on either side on this issue. There are, obviously, we know about AIDS. I'll come back to that in a minute, HIV and AIDS. But there are problems with homosexual behavior that are not related to HIV and AIDS. And it has to do with the particulars of human, for, for I, hate, I hate to be crude, but because of the plumbing of human beings, your body's not designed for this. So I'll put it that way. There's great details here, but your body's not designed for this. So one third of men who engage in regular homosexual receptive behavior have chronic incontinence or failures of the sphincter muscle because it's been damaged by the behavior. Chronic incontinence. Diarrhea, cramps, hemorrhoids, prostate damage, ulcers, and fissures, which invite infections, are all too common amongst those who engage in same-sex behaviors. In 75% of syphilis cases in 2012, they were amongst men who practiced sex with other men in 2012, according to the Center for Disease Control. Keep in mind that this percentage of men who, the 75% represents about 2% of the population's behavior. So it's, it, the, the, the chances of syphilis are astronomically high amongst men who practice sex with men. The most common disease is something called amoebiasis and 25 to 40% of homosexual men are affected by that disease. The, the list goes on and for sake of time, I'm going to move quickly here, but gonorrhea, chlamydia, uh, various viral infections, uh, like anal warts, herpes, hepatitis B, hepatitis A. Men who have sex with men have a typical STD rate that over a course of their lives, 75% of them will have STDs. Over the course of a year, 40% of them will have STDs. The general population has a lifetime STD rate of 16.9%, and that includes in there the homosexual group, and a yearly STD rate of 1.6%. Of course, not for anyone pretty much who stays a virgin until they're married, like the scripture declares. You don't have to worry if that's you. <laughs> you don't have to get tested or anything <laughs> because you're good to go. You're good to go. <clears throat> but I would say that every one of these STDs with, with almost no exceptions is going to have come from people doing what the Bible calls sin. Various cancers, it's not just STDs, Cancers such as colon cancer and even breast cancer are higher in the gay community. Don't ask me why breast cancer is higher amongst uh, lesbians, but it is. Statistically, it is. And that is acknowledged on, on uh, pro-gay websites. They're like, hey, women, you need to get this checked out and that checked out because your instances are higher of these different, different cancers. In, in the men who have sex with men who do not have HIV, who do not have HIV, they are 20 times more likely to get anal cancer. 20 times. In men who have sex with men who are HIV positive, they are 40 times more likely to get anal cancer. There, the list goes on uh, of cancers and things like this. It goes on and on and on. And it's, it's very unpleasant stuff because your heart hurts for people suffering these things. Amongst those who do have AIDS, well, in the current population, um, 1.2 people, 1.2 million people in the U.S. currently have HIV. 1.2 million people, the majority of which got it through male-to-male -male sexual behaviors. The HIV, um, the virus seems to have an affinity for the specific flesh of the rectum. It's, it's 
without any more details and that that is that is its its happy place to be and it's extremely dangerous for um, for men there are 50,000 new HIV infections every year in the United States we don't talk about it very much anymore not since uh, probably the 90s we sort of stopped talking about it but there are 50,000 new HIV infections every year and cdc.gov says that 70 percent 78% of all new HIV infections are a result of men having sex with men 78% of these 50,000 infections are men having sex with men, but you've got to keep something in mind. This is really shocking when you realize those who have sex with men on a regular basis is less than 2% in a given year of the population. Less than 2% of the population getting 78% of the HIV infections. What are the odds there? How many times more likely is it? I'm not, I don't, I'm not a mathematician, so I haven't figured it out. <laughs> I asked a mathematician, but <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, those stats come from the cdc.gov. They're not from pro-family websites that are trying to, to, to twist things. This is just yeah. related to um, not only diseases and those sorts of things, but drug and substance abuse are also radically increased amongst the homosexual community for some reason. Those who self-identify as homosexuals were found to have used tobacco in the past 30 days at a rate double the non-homosexual community. 18% of heterosexuals have used tobacco in the past 30 days, whereas 35% of homosexuals. Alcohol abuse has also increased, especially in the lesbian community. 35% of female homosexual women had a history of alcohol abuse compared to 5% of females in general. So they're seven times more likely to have alcohol abuse. Other similar statistics come from pro-gay sources that are saying the same thing because they're trying to help these gay people like, hey, watch out, you've got this tendency, we have these statistics and we want you to be careful, which is, which is good. 45% of the LGBT population, according to the Pride Institute, abuse alcohol, 45% versus about 15% of the general population. There are, it's not just alcohol and tobacco, 51% of homosexual males have a history of drug abuse, other drugs, compared to 7% in general. Men who have sex with men are 3.5 times more likely to use pot, marijuana, than men who do not have sex with men. These men are also 12.2 times more likely to use amphetamines than men who do not have sex with men. They are nine and a half times more likely to use heroin than men who don't have sex with men. <coughs> there are also increases in the homosexual community in other areas like depression, suicidal thoughts, and attempted suicide. And these things go, they all seem to go together, substance abuse and this sort of stuff. For the sake of time, I need to move forward. But related to reckless sexual behavior, the number of partners and the brevity of relationships in the homosexual community is radically different than that of the heterosexual community. A study of sexual profiles of 2,583 older homosexuals was published in the Journal of Sex Research. And the most common response given by 21.6 of the uh, respondents was of having 101 to 500 sex partners over their lifetime. That was the most common response given. 101 to 500 sex partners over the course of their lifetime. Only 2.7% of these men claimed to have only ever had sex with one partner. That's radically different than the, the heterosexual community. It's not just that study, nor is that the worst uh, statistics. Um, another study found that homosexual men had averaged over 20 partners per year. That was from LA in the late 1980s. Um, and perhaps that some of this has been curbed through, um, uh, you know, attempts to, to change their sexual habits of the community because of safety issues. But um, another three year long study in Boston in the late 80s found that 77% of the homosexuals surveyed had more than 10 partners in the previous five years. More than 10. 34% of them had more than 50 partners in that same amount of time. Several other studies have agreed, and some have given even more shocking numbers, probably depending on the 
the um, the demographics of the area they were at. This, the worst ones have been the ones taken from San Francisco area. But I didn't quote those to you because I'm not trying to give you the most shocking. I'm actually giving you the more conservative uh, numbers. Among heterosexuals, or uh, a study found that only 17% of men and 10% of women had more than one partner in the previous year. More than one. Only 17% of men and 10% of women. Just by comparison. So you don't think, well, everyone's doing that stuff. Well, this is, it's, it's radically different. So the number of partners and the brevity of relationships show a reckless sexual behavior happening inside the homosexual community. And that's a typical thing. Now, it's not every person, but it is that it is seems to be the, the theme. Same-sex long-term relationships are also, they're not a parallel to heterosexual marriage because even in long-term committed same-sex relationships, they are almost never monogamous. They are almost never faithful to only one partner. The frequency of sex outside of the long-term relationship is, inc is, is, ex <laughs> it is, it is, uh, it is very common. In one recent study, of gay male couples, 41.3% of them, of the couples, had open sexual agreements with some conditions or restrictions. 41% agreed with some conditions we will be able to have sex outside of our relationship with other people. 10% had open sexual agreements with no restrictions on sex out with outside partners. One fifth of the participants reported breaking their agreement in the preceding 12 months for those who agreed not to. This is something that even pro gay theologians would have to call sexually immoral. The sad truth is that the vast majority of same sex relationships, which last longer than five years, almost in every case, involve an agreement to have sex outside the relationship in order to satiate those desires. And that ends up being a keystone for keeping them together is that we are able to express our sexuality with various people in different times. This is not a parallel to marriage. In various gay studies, they talk, or very gay websites, they say, this is, this is a key. Hey guys, here's, you know, sometimes here's our advice to you. Make an agreement, talk about it, go ahead and make, give permission. And that way it, you can stay together so that it's not marriage. That's not marriage. That's, that's just cohabitating while sleeping around. Um, a third difference or a third issue here, a reason why we don't want to engage, uh, encourage, encourage and endorse homosexual behavior, encouraging it will increase it and it will increase the afflictions associated with it. I mean, if this is this drastic, if I'm losing years off of my life because of homosexual behavior, then I should at least not encourage it. I mean, what if the government went out there and posted ads encouraging people to start smoking cigarettes? And then anyone who came against them smoking cigarettes, they said, you're a, you're a bigot and a cigarettophobe. And it's just, it's irrational. If we're, if we're for the safety health-wise of society, we buy us for secular reasons alone, we, sh we don't want to encourage this behavior. And you might say that's not fair. Well, you're, well, in a sense, you're right. It's not fair. It's not fair to limit pilots to only people who have good vision. It's not fair to say a brother and sister can't marry, but it's safe and healthy to, to say these things. That's what society does. We, make this, we, we decrease the fairness or the freedom in order for safety and healthiness to be happening. And so we do this in some cases. It's not fair to tell me I can't drive on the other side of the road, but it's safe and healthy to tell me I can't drive on the other side of the road. Another reason for, uh, for this um, our secular case, same sex erotic relationships are inferior to heterosexual relationships in several, several capacities. One, the most obvious, they can not produce children. Society has a vested interest in marriage and in same sex relationship. I mean, uh, opposite sex relationships because these produce kids. You're all a result of these kinds of relationships. We must have these relationships for society to continue. We need children. Society must be invested in children or else it will fall. And so that's an, an inferiority uh, in uh, same-sex relationships. Uh, a same-sex relationship can't produce children any more than a relationship between a, a cow and a cloud can produce a child. It's just, it's completely impossible. There's only one way for this to happen. Also, it's inferior in raising children. And this is uh, new information that we didn't have several years back, but let me read you some information. Children who are raised in a same-sex marriage or same by a same-sex parent 
Um, well, they were analyzed in a study by a guy named Mark Regnerus from the University of Texas, Austin. And his study is, is, was published in Social Science, blah, 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 Social Science Research. Try saying that five times fast. And the quotes uh, that follow, I'll, I'll give you some information now about that. Um, it is the best and most thorough study to date, and it compared kids, it's the first one to really do this, compare kids raised by two married biological parents versus kids raised by a gay parent or gay parents. So they had lesbian mothers or gay fathers. The kids raised by a gay parent did worse on 77 out of 80 evaluating measures. For instance, they are much more likely to have received welfare. Kids raised by um, their biological family, mom and dad married, are 17% of them are, are on welfare or have received welfare. Lesbian mothers, their children, 69% of them receive welfare. Gay fathers, 57% of them receive welfare. So they just took specific points, added them all together to say, can we say this is wrong? Some of the other points where they had lower educational attainment. These kids report less safety and security in their family of origin. They report more ongoing negative in impact from their family of origin. So they're adults now reporting on having been raised. Ongoing negative impact. Um, they're more likely to suffer from depression. They've been arrested more often. Males and females raised by homosexual parenting have more opposite sex sexual partners than those raised by married biological parents. From a Christian perspective, this makes sense because sexual immorality is in the home, so it becomes normalized, so it becomes something they do when they get older. Um, but this study doesn't try to explain why it happens. It's just, not, it's just noting that it does. It found that children of homosexual fathers are nearly three times as likely and children of lesbian mothers are nearly four times as likely to identify as something other than entirely heterosexual. Children of lesbian mothers are 75% more likely and children of homosexual fathers are three times more likely to be currently in a same-sex romantic relationship. But the differences in homosexual conduct are even greater. The daughters of lesbians have four times as many female sexual partners than the daughters of married biological parents. And the daughters of the homosexual fathers have six times as many. Meanwhile, the sons of both lesbian mothers and homosexual fathers have seven times as many uh, same-sex sexual partners as sons of married biological parents. The most shocking and troubling outcomes, however, are those related to sexual abuse. Now, I want to be careful, and I ask you to listen carefully as you read this, as I read this to you. Children raised by lesbian mothers were 10 times more likely to have been, according to them, touched sexually by a parent or other adult caregiver. Now, it may have been the parent, or it may have been somebody else, another adult caregiver. We don't know. But they were 10 times more likely, 23% of them reported having been touched sexually as a child by a parent or adult caregiver versus only 2% of the children of married biological parents. That's a radical difference. While those raised by a homosexual father were three times more likely or a reported 6% chance that they were uh, touched in that way. In his, uh, in his text, but not in his charts, Regnerus breaks out these figures for only female victims and the ratios remain similar. Um, I'm just going to continue reading this to you for the sake of the posterity of it, but here we go. As to the question of whether you have ever been physically forced to have sex against your will, not necessarily in childhood, not, not necessarily not in childhood, affirmative answers came from 8% of children of married biological parents and 31% of children of lesbian mothers, nearly four times as many, and 25% of the children of homosexual fathers, three times as many. Again, when Regnerus breaks these figures out for females, who are more likely to be victims of sexual abuse in general. Such abuse was reported by 14% of the um, married biological families, but three times as many, or 46% of the lesbian mother's children and 52% of the gay father's children. So these statistics are, um, well, they're well-researched. It was carefully done. And there's amazing amount of hate coming out of certain groups against not only Regnerus, but anybody who quotes his stuff and I guess I'll be next. But can I say this? To endorse same-sex marriage is to endorse same-sex parenting. That makes sense, right? Unless you're going to say they can get married, but they can't have kids. 
This is why Catholic Charities Adoption Agency was forced to close their doors in 2006 after in Massachusetts they, uh, they voted in same-sex marriage. They were forced to close their doors because the, the state said you can't refuse same-sex parents. You have to give kids to them too. And they said, we're just going to stop. Later that year in San Francisco, the, another branch stopped their adoption services for the same reason. In 2010, the Washington Catholic Charities closed their foster adoption services. In 2011, Catholic Charities of Illinois closed down. Their lawyer famously stated, in the name of tolerance, we are not being tolerated. They were going to be forced to put children in same-sex homes, and they said that's against our beliefs and our religion, our moral values, and so they were shut down. So in other words, for the sake of children, we need to not endorse this behavior. There's actually a growing number of children as adults now, now that this has been happening for long enough that some of them are adults, coming out and openly saying, and even starting organizations against allowing same-sex people to adopt. That says a lot. So lastly, it redefines marriage in a devaluing and unjustified way. We don't have a good reason to change the, the view of morality and the view of society and go against the scripture and go against what's healthy for society and healthy for the individuals as, and all of the above. Every, for every reason, it seems to be wrong. It seems to be wrong.